All right, guys. Um, folks, we, we welcome you. We thank you for being with us once again. Uh, this is our third installment of our four-part fall series, the Black Culture Matters series here at Prince George's Community College. Uh, I am Dr. Ieli Ichile. I'm the director of the African American Studies Institute at Prince George's Community College. I'm also a professor of African American, African, and African diaspora history. Uh, I am intensely excited to bring us all together once again. If you missed our earlier two events, please find them linked in uh, the PGCC TV YouTube channel, as I just mentioned. Uh, this event will be up in another week on that same YouTube channel. I just want to uh, briefly read the mission statement of the African American Studies Institute. The mission of the African American Studies Institute at Prince George's Community College is to facilitate the critical study of the realities and possibilities of people of African descent, both in and beyond the Prince George's County learning community. Anchored in the Division of the Humanities, English, and Social Sciences at PGCC, the AASI engages in digital outreach, educational programs, research, and community partnerships. The primary goal is to create spaces in which Black life ways are affirmed, justice is a top priority, and healthy futures are envisioned. I also need to say that this project was made possible in part by a grant from Maryland Humanities through support from the Maryland Historical Trust in the Maryland Department of Planning. So <laughs> I must let you know that any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Maryland Humanities, the Maryland, the Maryland Historical Trust, or the Maryland Department of Planning. So I'd also like to give a special thanks to Dr. Nicole Currier, the Dean of the Humanities, English, and Social Sciences Division, as well as the Chair of the Social Sciences Department, my chair, Dr. Corey Brown. There are so many other people that I, I need to thank, but in the interest of time, uh, just please accept my heartfelt thank you, everyone else who has helped to make this come together. I need to thank everybody until the clock runs out, man. No, no, well, yes, a life lived in gratitude is a life lived indeed, right? So this is Dr. Tony Medina. He's the author of 20 books for adults and young readers, including Deshaun Days, Bum Rush the Page, A Deaf Poetry, Love to Langston, Roll Call. Books. I'm not going to read all 20. A Generational Anthology of Social and Political Black Literature and Art, Committed to Breathing, and Follow Up Letters to Santa from Kids Who Never Got a Response. Medina's debut graphic novel, I Am Alfonso Jones, received numerous honors, including the New York Public Library Best Books for Teens. His book, 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Boy, received the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award honor and Arnold Adolph Poetry Award Special Recognition, and it made the New York Times recommended list of 14 anti-racist books for kids and teens. Medina has read and performed his work all over the United States, as well as in Puerto Rico, Germany, France, Poland, the Bahamas, and the Netherlands. And he's also the first professor of creative writing at Howard University. Tonight's topic is writing freedom, black literature and social justice. This is going to be a slightly different format. We are following Dr. Medina's creative uh, flow and uh, we're going to uh, allow him to begin with whichever reading comes to mind. Our, our events tend to be guided by the spirit of Nina Simone, and we'll be talking about her a little bit more later. And so whatever comes to you, we're going to... Well, my, my thing is this, right, um, yes. Ellie, is that, yeah. um, you know, lecturing, it's okay when you have to do it. You know, you find yourself doing it in classes more and more sometimes because the students are just like sitting there like a deer with headlights, right? <laughs> deer in headlights. So I like to have a more dynamic, interactive engagement. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you start off with, with an interrogation, some questions, and then I'll <laughs> okay. jump, in there, jump in there with some uh, readings. Maybe uh, the viewers will have some uh, questions that they want to pose. Yes, you know, we're going to put that in there. Okay, so can I ask, I, I can start off with something? Yes. Okay, I have a prompt. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do like if this were Nina Simone sitting here. With James Baldwin. Okay. Uh, Nina and James. What would you read them of your work? Well, let me just say one thing. Yes. People don't know this, but you know, I Baraka put this, Amiri Baraka put this in, in his one of his latest books. Mm -hmm. it, 
talking about the music and stuff. And he did a long piece on Nina Simone because literally Nina Simone lived in, 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 in their house with him and his wife and his family and stuff at, at some point. Um, she's powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure if everyone has noticed recently that you see all these movies and these um, TV shows on all these different you know, um, platforms they're using Nina Simone's music, you know? And there was a documentary that her daughter put out. It was kind of negative about her. Um, I saw her actually perform in person at Carnegie Hall in New York City hmm. back in the 90s. So what's your question again? If she were here, if, if, if she and James Baldwin were sitting here on this Zoom webinar, and the point was to read them something that you would want them to hear. What would you read them? Okay, I would read them when I'm going out of order because I would read them a poem um, from 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Boy. Mm -hmm. And this is a poem that I, that I, well, it's a book that I wrote in the midst of writing my first graphic novel, I Am Alfonso Jones, which dealt with police brutality. And I didn't like the, the, the notion of people of color, Black folks, having to always plead for our humanity in public, right? To say, we're human, we're human. Why are you treating us like this? We're human. I wanted to create a poem that just basically shows you the reality of black boyhood, the joy, the pain, you know, all that type of stuff and how we celebrate black boys. And, um, you know, they're made of, you know, flesh and bone like anybody else. And, you know, when they uh, fall, when they tumble, they scrape their knees and they bleed. So this is called, this is an introduction to my book. And it's from 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Boy. Black boys scrape their knees, they bleed. Black boys cry and scream. They tackle life like air, gliding on wind, basking in a breeze. Black boys sit beneath trees, inhale and Black boys play with building blocks, are fascinated by clocks, cradle skateboards under their arms. Black boys love basketball and books, toss footballs and leaf through pages lost in stories and myths. Black boys love comic books and superheroes, are heroes to little sisters and brothers. Black boys love popcorn and watching movies love their grandmas and grandpas. Black boys hug and kiss their moms and emulate their dads. Black boys wear their daddy's shoes and ties, smear shaving cream on their smooth faces, giggling in steamy mirrors. Black boys shine bright in sunlight, build snowmen and have snowball fights. Black boys study the stars, Looking through telescopes, lie on their backs in tall grass, staring at the blanket of blue sky, at all the eyes smiling and twinkling down on them. Black boys like to hum and drum, bebop, hip hop, like to dance and sing, jazz and scream. Black boys are three dimensions of beauty. Black boys go to church, ride buses, go to school, sit on stoops, fly kite, shoot hoops. Black boys like to sit in there quiet and think about things. Black boys are made of flesh, not clay. Black boys have bones and blood and feelings. Black boys have minds that thrive with ideas like bees around a hive. Black boys are alive with wonder and possibility, with hopes and dreams. Black boys be bouquets of tonka, bunched up like flowers. They be paint blotched into a myriad of colors across the canvases of our hearts. 
We celebrate their preciousness and creativity. We cherish their lives. Wow, that's amazing. That's what I would like to read to them because I know they will be concerned uh, at this moment. They will be really angry about what's happening. Not only to the black boys, but also black girls too. And black mm. women and black men. Mm. So that's wow. where I'm from. Okay. So in your work, it was, yeah, it was powerful. Thank you. for And the comments are coming in. We have check-in from Australia. <laughs> Again, Kingston, New York, all kinds of places. Um, have you written about Black girls? Yeah, I mean, I have in, in my graphic novel, I have a main character named Domena Jimenez. Um, she's a Dominican Black girl. And also I have a poem here in this anthology called We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices um, that Wade Hudson and um, Cheryl Hudson put together and they basically, you know, in conjunction with Random House, they're publishers of Just Us Books, one of the oldest black publishing houses in the country and they're out of Jersey like 40 years plus strong, you know? Mm -hmm. But there was this incident that took place a couple of years back in New York um, about a little 13 year old girl in ICE agents. And I, and when I say, when I use the term black, I don't just relegate it to like African-American. I'm talking about the African diaspora. I'm talking about a global blackness, right? Right. Um, so this is a story um, that I wrote off of this incident, and I felt compelled to write about it. Um, so it's based on a true story, but it's fictionalized, of course. And it's called One Day Papi Drove Me to School. Mm. And the original story took place in Harlem, and I'm, you know, my people are from Harlem. One, one day Papi drove me to school like he always does, talking about my homework, science, history, and math. He made a funny face when I told him all I had to add. Lots of kids were in front of the building and others were being dropped off. I turned to Papi to ask him, will you pick me up after school? And before I knew it, four cops came running toward him. I heard a commotion. Look to my right and scream, Poppy, Poppy. I saw my Poppy go down on the ground, tackled and shackled and hands cuffed behind his back. I couldn't, I could not see Poppy's face. The cop with his knee on Poppy's back smashed it into the pavement as he grabbed a fistful of Poppy's hair. All I could see were Poppy's jeans and his construction boots. I screamed. The world started to sweep from beneath my feet and buildings started to tumble and I nearly had an asthma attack from my constant screams. One cop, a woman with the word ice on her back, pulled me by my waist as I flailed and kicked in desperation. Students, parents, and some teachers crowded around as the officers held me to the ground while my papi was pushed into a police van. La migra, la migra, someone yelled. Others laughed with their fat fish faces, taunting me with alien and illegal and get out and go back to your country. I shouted, this is my country, you stupid doofus heads. Before I knew it, a crowd of white kids surrounded me, but other kids, black and brown and some white, came to my rescue. Somehow, though, I was the one who was taken to the principal's office. Two, now the school was split in half. A crazy group of kids will make America great again just to taunt us. But others, black, brown, and white kids were down with us and not racism. In all my nine years on the planet, I never had a fight but a handful of kids wanted to start trouble. One day, 
They scrunched up their faces and balled up their fists. We stepped forward in unison. We took our jackets and our sweaters and dropped them to the ground. Then we stuck out our chests real proud so they could see our t-shirts that read, I am not an alien. I am not illegal. Why don't you go back to your country? It's not my song. Name. No more borders. No more walls. Three. The bullies backed down that day and moved on to their classrooms. The next day, the Make America Great Again hats had disappeared. Instead, some kids asked, where can I get the cool t-shirts? We didn't get any more glares or stares. One of the boys who bullied me even came up to me and said, my mom's a lawyer. She can help your dad. And as we walked to our class, he turned to me. Guess what? I said, what? I'm just like you. I gave him the side eye and answered back, a girl? He laughed and I laughed. And then he said, my father's from Croatia. Four. That would make the perfect ending for a movie. But this is real life. And they took my papi away. And once again, the world was swept from under my feet and mommy's. She has to find a new job to help take care of us and help get back, help get papi back. One day, my papi drove me to school, a day I'll never forget. I get sad and scared when I think about where Poppy is. I keep his photo in the gold locket he gave me last Christmas. I keep it pressed tight and close to my heart. Wow. Thank you. The artwork is from Edel Rodriguez. Wow. That was so, beautiful. Uh, you know, a black Latin girl, <laughs> you know? Dealing yeah. with um, that. So I have a question so about this piece. this piece. I have a question okay. about this piece. Um, we're getting comments that you know that it's beautiful and it's powerful. We have check-ins from Feasterville, Pennsylvania, and Chiapas, Mexico, and Austin, Texas. Um, but we're all thinking yeah. about the the double ending. Why did you find it important to kind of create this fantastical Hollywood ending and then give us the real one? Because that's how, re that's how life is for us. That's how reality is, you know. Um, we grow up watching TV and movies and stuff like that, and we always get the Hollywood ending. And, and, and in my graphic novel, I Am Alfonso Jones, there is no Hollywood ending. You know, there is no um, resolution, you know. Um, he doesn't get... Well, I don't want to say too much, but you know what I mean? Uh, what happens with us, we have to continue to struggle. And the, the sad thing is that people, a lot of people, ELE, do, do not understand about um, the diaspora. Yeah. You know, the African diaspora. You know, all roads lead to Africa, you know, culturally, genetically, this and that. But when you get to... Um, certain uh, cultures in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in Central America, blah, blah, blah. You have in Haiti, you know, other parts of the Caribbean. And in India too, you have these class, uh, these, these caste systems based on color, right. color consciousness, interracism and stuff like that. And um, a lot of my work interrogates that in a sense, you know? That's important. That's important. I think there's so much about people of African descent seeing themselves as a global people, a globally connected people. I think we miss out on a lot of um, our tools and our resources when we don't see it. And we also kind of miss out on seeing the common struggle that we share. We feel but, isolated in the things that we experience. Um, but um, you have to also see yourself mm -hmm. as African, as indigenous, you know, right. as, like, like, I, I see somebody say, I'm Jamaican. You know, you have to see yourself as an Arawak, as a Taino. You have to see yourself as an Indian. You have to see yourself as, a, as mm -hmm. coming from Africa. Have, you know, the base of your, your identity is African culture. Your roots are African culture. But right. the negation of that, you know, even in terms Hispanic and Latin and Latinx, 
there's no nothing that points to Africa there. Right. You know, so you find yourself, you know, as a person of the Caribbean, as a person of whatever, you, you have to be very specific in terms of how you identify yourself because you cannot succumb to the erasure of blackness. Yes. So help us understand more about you as an artist and this particular vein, this particular theme and motivation within your work. Is it because of your background? Where you where are you from? And then, or did it this type of Pan-African global consciousness arrive later through school or some sort of mentor? I think it was, I think it was always there. It lies dormant until you get, you know, some spark that sets you off. But I come from, you know, I was born in the Bronx, the South Bronx, in my family. My father was born in Harlem. A lot of my, most of my family comes from Harlem, you know, and um, I, when I was coming up, I, I, I wasn't surrounded by books and stuff like that. You know, um, the only models for reading I had was my grandmother and my father every now and then, but not really, you know, directly. Um, it was by chance that I, you know, got hooked into reading by um, being forced to write a book report, to do a book report that I neglected to do and getting a second opportunity. And it was a book called Flowers for Algernon. So that led me on to wanting to, by Daniel Keyes, that led me want to be a writer. And from then on, I could remember, um, I was high school age and I wanted to be a writer. And I was always, you know, whenever I was like, bored or lonely or um, sad or whatever, or just whatever. I just found myself in a bookstore. And one, one afternoon I found myself, um, cause I used to go to school not too far away from 42nd street on 33rd in Park Avenue. I found myself in the bookstore and I was in the poetry section. And by that time I was into poetry. I was writing poetry. I don't know where that came from because I wasn't reading poetry but I found a copy of the selected poems of Langston Hughes hmm. and Langston was on the cover and he was at his manual typewriter in his Harlem apartment and he was looking over his shoulder and when I saw his face I was like oh my god he looked like somebody directly out of my family mm -hmm. right and so I can identify with him and I started reading the poems and they had to do it Harlem life and the people, you know, the characters that you find and this and that, you know, street life and all that stuff. And I was like, wow, because I was never exposed to that type of stuff in mm -hmm. poetry. And um, it was very affirming to me, you know, not only the image of a black man on the cover of a book, but also the poetry that reflected Park Avenue and Harlem and stuff like that. So mm. that was kind of like the basis. And then as I got older, and started to branch out on my reading, I became influenced by the Black Arts Movement, the New Rican Poets Movement, Central American Poets, Caribbean Poets, African Poets, you know, revolutionary poets, basically. And then, you know, I'm, I'm reading, you know, everything. And I'm, 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 in the, I'm in the military making money to go to college, but I'm mm -hmm. reading Marxist-Leninist literature and shit. <laughs> and getting wow. in trouble for that. Getting in trouble for that. Mm. Getting in trouble in the military for that? You were doing that while you were serving? Well, you know, people were giving me the side eye and like, you know, this was back in the day and, you know, they didn't understand like, what the fuck? Like Tony Medina's, you know, who is this guy reading, um, you know, Karl Marx, <laughs> mm, <laughs> the Communist it. Manifesto. So, you know, a lot of things uh, influenced me, but basically my reality growing up, I learned how to write literally from reading James Baldwin. I couldn't understand mm. what the teachers were talking about when it came to punctuation, grammar, all that stuff. It was like another language, wah, 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 like Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. But when I read James Baldwin's essays, and mind you, James Baldwin's essays were so long. Like one sentence would take up a whole page. And I was just mesmerized, like, because it was communicated as if he's talking directly to you. Yeah. But I was mesmerized. I was wondering like, well, how the hell does he punctuate that? And that's how I learned how to do punctuation. Wow. But not only, not only was it about James Baldwin's writing and his style and his aesthetic, um, it was what he was talking about. He too was talking about the Harlem of Langston Hughes and stuff like that. He just happened to be a, young, a younger generation, you know, right. and a prose writer instead of a, a poetry. 
And so James Baldwin was a big influence, you know, mm. and his image on his book cover was an influence to me. And I know it also influenced um, Amiri Baraka when he was a young poet in the village known as Leroy Jones in the Beat Generation. And he walked, you know, in front of this um, bookstore and he saw James Baldwin on the cover of a book. So when Baraka had that experience with James Baldwin's image, I had a similar, you know, decades later experience with um, Langston's image. Yeah. I always see James Baldwin. And that's Baldwin. affirmation. And that's why we need to have Black representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always see James Baldwin as a link between maybe two different generations of, of writers um, before and after him. Uh, so, okay, so you learned grammar and syntax from, from James Baldwin? That's so interesting. I learned uh, how to punctuate. I learned all that from James Baldwin. Well, you could have had a work teacher. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I'm gonna because um, I mean, I, I I didn't know I didn't know the rules of grammar and punctuation by the book, but I knew it by instinct from from picking up pointers from how Baldwin constructed his sentences, and he literally wrote as if he was speaking directly to you. Absolutely. But the sentences. Flawless. Right. So you're getting some high praise in the comments. Um, someone is saying that you should be on CNN, PBS, HBO, um, that, you, that you're bringing, you know, the raw realities. Um, someone raises the question of where they can find um, the book, the, the previous book that you did the reading from. Um, about the ice. Boy is on, yeah. um, you can see it on Amazon or anywhere. Penny Kitty Books is the publisher. So outside can, of Amazon. Anywhere books are sold, or you can go directly to the publisher. It's a small press called Penny Candy Books. Penny Candy Books. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question. How do you respond to those who consider their race superior and devalue Black lives? Well, it's just silly. It's stupid. It's ignorant. It's uh, ignorant of history. I mean, all, all um, humanoids come from Africa. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And mm -hmm. the wild part is that the last two humanoids left standing back in the day was the Neanderthals mm -hmm. and um, what we call the Homo sapiens. And the Homo sapiens were directly out of Africa. The Neanderthals came out of Africa, but they emerged um, and evolved in Europe and Asia. Right. And so... Uh, they died out because the Homo sapiens who came from Africa, um, they had a communal society and, um, you know, they just had a different way of living and, 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 and dealing with uh, the environment that they outlasted everybody else. And you talk about millions of years between all these people and stuff like that. But the, hu the, um, the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals literally were uh, living at the same time, you know, um, occupying the same space at the same time. And human beings to this day have about 25% uh, Neanderthal DNA. But it was the Africans that, you know, the, the, the humans that walked upright and came out of Africa that survived to this day. So all of us literally on the planet are Africans. So. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> so talking about a superior race is almost it's ridiculous for me it's reasons. silly there's no such thing as race anyway right okay you know i go with jose marti there's no such thing as race it's a construct right um so i have a question about um one of your one of your students girlfriends uh commented here uh saying that 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 the the boyfriend loved the class. I think that was the comment. But um, girlfriend, <laughs> I'm, uh, I just want to scroll up and make sure that I'm saying that correctly. Um, fun. This is fun the way you're moderating. I like that. <laughs> but the so of Zoom. I mean, it it made me yes. It says this is Kim. My boyfriend's in your class. You're doing amazing. So teaching. Let's talk about teaching creative writing, teaching African-American literature or African diaspora literature. What do you, how do you teach students creativity? What is their, what is the approach and how do you tie that with racial justice, social justice? You don't really 
teach creativity, you draw creativity out of people. You know, the Nicaraguans always had this saying that I love, you know, and they were a nation of poets. You know, their poet laureate was Ernesto Cardenal. And um, I really love the Nicaraguan poets. And, and there's a, a film that's about when they were in warfare and also the poetry aspect called Azul. I forgot the name of the film. Like I, I knew who he was, but I forgot. Um, and so they, they, had, they believed that everybody was born a poet. It's society that takes that away. And it's, you know, you're, you know, you have to get that back, you know, in the struggle. Uh, for justice and freedom. So um, you don't teach creativity. You kind of like inspire it and bring it out and draw, you draw it out and you allow the student to identify it. You give them prompts so they could create. And then in the process of that, you show them a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you, you know, you, 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 you subtly teach them certain things. It's kind of like, you know how when you're teaching a child to ride a bike without the training wheels and you're holding on until you let go and they're balancing, it's like that, you know? And they don't know that you let go, but they're like riding on their own and stuff like that. That's what teaching creativity is about. I've been at Howard, next year will make, 18 years, you know, I was invited to, to come to teach here by the legendary um, Dr. Elena Trello, who was a good friend of James Baldwin and, and, and Tony Morrison and Tony K. Bambada um, and on and on. And um, she asked me if I would come and teach at Howard and I was in graduate school at the time and I couldn't turn that down, right, you know. So, um, what I try to do is expose my students to everything that I know about being a poet, being an author, being an editor, being an anthologist. I teach them, I give them all of my tools and, and they make all these things throughout a semester. And then I send them out into the world. It's up to them if they want to continue on, you know what I mean? But at least these undergraduates uh, leave there almost like they're in a graduate level class, even more so. In my class in, at Howard, had be, at, as soon as I got there, it became um, open to the community. It was a class that anybody in the community crashed. Much like John Oliver Killens was doing at Mega Evers College, where he opened up his classroom to the community of black writers that wanted to study under this great you know, um, fiction writer who was a contemporary of James Baldwin and stuff like that. you know. John Oliver Killens, the great John Oliver Killens. And they were up in there in Brooklyn doing, all, doing their thing. And so that's what it, repre it represents and stuff like that. So um, I just exposed them to the stuff. And, 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 um, and because we're at, at with Howard and because, um, you know, where we come from, you know, their, po their poems become, you know, they're personal at times, but they mostly are social and political. You know, Why do you think I, that is? Because they black <laughs> in America. I mean, come on. You know what I mean? Um, we don't have the luxury of the white poet or the white fiction writer or the white artist to not engage in reality and not fight and, and participate in the struggle and do as James Baldwin charged us to do, which is to bear witness, you know, we testify, we bear witness. And so, yeah, we would love to just like get lost in our imaginations and deal with something. We do that in Afrofuturism, but even in Afrofuturism, you get in the nitty gritty of colonialism, neo-colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, all that stuff, racism, it takes right. place. You know? Agreed. Much of much of Afro Afrofuturism is really a response and a, an intentional getting away from the colonized uh, aspects of yeah. our current lived experiences. Yeah. And our I mean, past. you don't really have to do that much heavy lifting in terms of world building because you just look at history. Right. You just change the the names and the places. You know. Right. Um, Betty Haskins and, has and the irony of. Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. 
she says, what's the connection between having a vision and creativity? I think that's kind of wrapped up into what you're talking about now. Maybe even a future vision. Well, most artists, most artists have an aesthetic vision. And, you know, I think James Baldwin was one. I think, I'm not, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, James Baldwin said this a long time ago, that you're always working on the same, <laughs> the same project. You know, um, every writer, every poet, every novelist, whatever, it's like from book to book, you literally wake, work, working on the same project, you're doing it in different ways. Um, so that's your vision. Um, Larry Neal, uh, they put together a posthumous book on Larry Neal, the great Larry Neal, um, part of the Black arts movement and the Black aesthetic movement, uh, poet, you know, uh, critic. He had... His, one of his books that came out after he passed, he passed around the same year as um, Bob Marley. I think it was 81. Um, um, Visions of a Liberated Future. And that was a phrase taken from one of his, I guess one of his essays or whatever. And I think that's what most artists of color are involved in. And, and of course, some white artists, because I mean, the Irish don't play. You know, the Irish are colonized. Um, they're considered the niggers of Europe. And so you get Yates and all these other cats coming after that. And look at U2, you know, U2 is very political. Um, and so in the IRA, <laughs> you know, they used to, bombs used to go off in London like clockwork from the IRA, you know, the, the Irish Revolutionary Army. And so, um, and look at Sinead O'Connor, but, um, yeah, does that does that answer your question? I believe so. It answers it for me. Um, so on on this same in the same vein about the political nature of writing, um, when you teach writers and expose students to writers from Africa, the Caribbean, other parts of the diaspora. Um, what, who are some of the major artists you, you must teach that you always go to and then, and why, why them are, is there a political connection there? Well, I try to like expose them to everybody that I write all these names on the blackboard, but a lot of times I go to Ntsisaki Shange, Audre Lorde, um, Sonia Sanchez, Baraka, um, I expose them to the New York and poets. You know, um, it just depends on, you know, how I'm feeling a certain day or whatever, you know. Pat Parker is a great poet, you know, that I like so much. Um, Lucille Clifton, of course, you know, I love Lucille Clifton. So I try to expose them to as many as possible. Plus I give them an anthology, um, I give them a midterm project, which is a mock anthology and they have to go out and find poets and stuff like that. In that process, they go on their own journey of discovery in terms of poetry and poets, particularly, because you know you get a lot of undergraduates that not, they don't really read poetry and stuff like that. They've been taught to be intimidated by poetry. And if you are introduced to black poetry, you know, it's like, whoa, your mind is blown because of the fact that um, it speaks directly to you and it's, it's not, something that's so um, uh, elusive. Okay, so getting outside of the teaching framework. Um, oh, we have a question inside the teaching framework. Is your class open to the virtual community? I'm sure if you just, if, if you just, uh, you know, uh, ask again, and I'm going to let you in. I, I let everyone in. Even my, even my class at Howard, you know, the physical room, Anybody could come in and students will always bring their friends, you know, especially around um, uh, spring break and stuff when they had different spring breaks. Yeah, I I've definitely experienced the same thing. I've had students bring their, <laughs> their parents, their but, children. But you, have to write. <laughs> but you have to write. I'm not going to let you off the hook. You're going to have to contribute too. <laughs> That's right. No spectators here. That's important. That's important. Um, so, okay. So as an artist and a performer, what is your approach to performing? And, and connect that please to your, your vision, right? Each artist having that aesthetic vision. 
we, we definitely already have been exposed to a little bit of kind of the explosive way that you read your work. How'd you create that? Is that, a, is that something you intentionally well, have you know, done? Well, um, when I was coming up, I would say in the um, late 80s, me and my contemporaries, and I used to hang out with people like Kevin Powell, Willie Perdermo, Paul Beatty, Tish Benson, uh, Asha Bandeli, Jessica Moore, Saul Williams, you know, all these people. But when we came up, we were literally like, we were, you know, in New York, they have like the village and the village is where you would go if you wanted to buy like vintage clothing, you know, used clothes and stuff like that. And we were really into uh, bebop and, and, and jazz and stuff like that. And we just thought that the jazz musicians were the baddest mofos, right? The way they, their style, the way they dress and stuff like that. And even Miles Davis, when he, he used to play the horn and, and turn his back on the audience. And people thought that that was him saying F you to white people, but he really wanted that sound off the wall and stuff like that. <laughs> and so um, I, I developed my kind of uh, reading, like Charlie Parker was known never to play the same song the same way, right? He died ver very young on a, on a hero heroin overdose. But um, so in my thing was, I thought that, you know, the poem should dictate how it should be performed or read. And so I always consider myself uh, a jazz musician with the paper as my horn in a sense, right? My instrument. And that was my first initial way of protecting me from the nervousness of live audience, you know, uh, performance. But it also allowed me to, to, to become like a Sasha Fierce, you know, have a persona where I could just like play this instrument. And that's how it began with me for performance, you know, for reading. But always let the words take over and dictate how a poem should be uh, rendered in the open air. Okay. Do, do you turn your back on the audience though? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But let oh. me give you, let me give you a, a little, a little, a little performance. Come on with it. This is, uh, if I can find my poem, damn it. Okay. So I did this anthology called Resisting Arrest, Poems to Stretch the Sky. The subtitle was taken from a, a line from uh, Sonia Sanchez's poem. She has two poems in this collection. And we have so many people in here. It's incredible. But this is all about police brutality and stuff like that. It came out in 2016. Um, Jack Carr Press out of North Carolina. And I use this a lot in my classrooms. All the proceeds go to a student um, working in social justice and stuff like that, right? Either high school or a college student. But this is my poem. Um, it's called From the Crushed Voice Box of Freddie Gray. And Freddie Gray was killed by the police in um, Baltimore. And I woke up literally out of my sleep writing this poem. I was so angry at what happened. And there's two things that go on in here. And I need to, to make note of it. Um, there was an incident that took place where a brother was um, handcuffed behind his back and he was in the back of a patrol car. And he was killed and he had a, a bullet hole in his chest. And, you know, um, the burns from the gun and the stripling from the bullets was like point blank, like pressed against his chest, his skin. And he was handcuffed behind his back and the coroner ruled that it was a suicide. <clears throat> From the crushed voice box of Freddie Gray. And this cover photo is from the poet photographer Thomas Ayers Ellis, who was one of the founders of the Darkroom Collective. <laughs> From the crushed voice box of Gray, Freddie Gray. I am the magic Negro, the black Houdini, who done it, done it to himself. I handcuffed my own damn self. 
I threw myself in the back of the patrol car. My hands shackled behind my back, slave ship cargo ago. I am the magic Negro, the black Houdini, who done it, do's it to himself, him black self. See my no hands. I snatched the pistol from the white man's mind, from the back of the patrol car. Suck on this, Houdini. I grabs the gun and shoot myself in the chest, neo-colonial style. The autopsy report says, damn, would have been easier to walk on. You shot himself. I am the magic Negro spineless. I broke my own spine after hot tying myself into a pretzel. Even Houdini, who done it, would envy. Only to turn myself into a human pinball, rattling around the steel gullet of a Negro pickup truck once reserved for newly arrived potato, potato famine New York Irish drunks down on their luck. Me, moi, it is I who was a fellow. Oh, hell no. Yes, me, the magic Negro, the black Houdini who done it, do's it all the time to himself, his own damned self. So the poem dictates <laughs> how it's going to be read for the most part. For me, at least. Mm -hmm. You got you got some snaps here. It, it it was called from the voice the crushed voice box of Freddie Gray. From the crushed voice from the crushed voice box of Freddie Gray. How do you create a title? Do you write the poem first? I've been known as a title master. Your titles are yeah. I was I would agree. So <laughs> that's why I asked because your titles Most just. Times, yeah. Most times the titles come first. Even when I'm working on a book, like when I had Alfonso Jones, I um, mean, I have to have the title, I am Alfonso Jones. And, you know, sometimes with a publishing house, they'd be like, oh no, you know, no, I have domain under my title. So in order for me to write that book, I had to have the title in my head. It's wow. just, you know, a pet peeve. Can you say more about the poem though? People are, are like, what about the I, poem? I think it put us in a space. I feel like there was so much in the way I that woke up writing that poem. That poem just came like that. Okay. But it's, um, I've, I've been writing so much about police brutality, I swear to God, that I have a book that's coming out with all of my stuff that deals with police violence and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. An entire book. It's over 70 pages. So, um... I don't know why, but I, I respond in different ways. So I take different angles and, and my mind just works that way. Like this poem I'm gonna read right now. It's called Double Dare. And um, it deals with um, George Floyd. But what stuck with my mind in my subconscious was the image of the white cop kneeling on um, George Floyd's neck and rocking back and forth. And so there, you know, my subconscious picks up on that and it, and it starts to, you know, marinate and matriculate and this is where the poem forms. Double Dare. Was the cop kneeling on George Floyd's neck as he lay gasping for his last breath, praying to his white Jesus? Was he taking a knee to shine a light on police brutality? Was he brutal when he rocked back and forth like a hobby horse applying pressure? Did the rocking make him think about his childhood? Was he dreaming with one hand in his pocket Cowboy ritual applying more and more pressure as George Floyd managed to cry out of his dead mother, out for his dead mother. I can't breathe, please. Your knee is on my neck. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Was he caught up in his childhood days, magically thinking he was back on that dime store horse or on top of his Amy Cooper 
or Karen or any old Becky Bronco breaking from his past, aggressively, aggressively groping, applying all that pressure as pedestrians pleaded with him to stop, to stop, to stop. Did the cop get his rocks off as he rocked back and forth until George Floyd was no longer pleading? Did he enjoy taunting George Floyd's limp flesh as a piss stream leaked out his black body along with his last breath when the lynch mob photo op gleam in his eyes whispered to a dead George Floyd, get up, get up, get up, as if a dare, a double dare, or a simple dime storm memory, giddy up, giddy up. Giddy up. Yeah, wow. So um, I would like to introduce one more in terms of how you get into the mindset and the performance. This is, um, this poem I wrote when the great Afro-Boricua poet um, and one of the founders of the New Yorkian poetry movement, um, which parallels the, the Black arts in New York, um, Tato Lavera passed away. Tato Lavera, I went to his funeral. It was in mid Manhattan. And man, it was, <laughs> it was a funeral, man. It was jazz and Santeria and all this stuff, right? And so I wrote this poem off of that experience and it's dedicated to him. And another thing, going back to the beginning of what we were talking about in terms of diaspora, this is a quint quintessential piece that kind of celebrates the African diaspora. It's, it's called Dame. And this, this great um, broadside was created by the poet and artist, um, Sammy Miranda, who um, hosts a poetry series out of the American Poetry Museum in DC. So, you know, if you're ever in DC, try to come out or, or go, go online and find the American Poetry Museum. Uh, it's a space that the other poet, Fred Joyner, um, owns. So this is called Dame un Traguito, para Otava Vera. A traguito is a little shot. And uh, another thing, um, a tecato is Puerto Rican street slang for a heroin addict. It is clear to see that Jesus was a conguero, beating back bongo skins till his palms bled bloodshot, raw shot red. No need to put an accent over the E to know who he be. Claro que si. Pa, 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 pa. Cucucuru. Pa, 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 pa. Cucucuru. Pa, 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 pa. Then he sang. Back up Boogaloo for Obatala. Swore by the hypnotic effects of a bolero caught in the throat of a rising sun, suddenly sinking. A Tecatos Jones coming down on 110th Street and Lexington Avenue in the crusty eyelash of El Barrio. Then he multiplied wine by sending his little cousin Pipo to cop a few bottles from Pepo's bodega where he kept a muscatel stash just beneath the alabaster statuette of San Lazaro and Bustelo can't earn of Doña Chicha's ashes atop the register with the faded Polaroids of his pregnant tia in Ponce and his songless tío with the afro the size of Saturn in Sing Sing inked up from head to toe. It's plain to see that Jesus spoke in 4-4 four, four time ago, that he tapped his dusty, rusty patent leather sapatos to a rhythm only the children of Africans and Indians understand. Bailando con Yemaya, buscando la claridad, singing el agua limpia todo. Oh, was he born in a manger? Or Morrisania Hospital, the critics will ask their silly questions like social workers, dumb to the reality of the times, but Jesus will pay them no mind. Nor will he adhere to the census takers, giving a side eye to tax collectors. The only numbers he cares about come out in New York or Brooklyn. 
so he could buy his baby a new pair of shoes, so he could walk on water, dry puddles, or why no piss, or tap his toes, trying to mimic the sound of dominoes, click, or ring fingers slapping against the stiff neck of beer bottle, to once sun big viejitos in guayabera shirts and Panama hats shouting, Manteca! Con cerveza breath, working his arms and legs into a sweat drenched rum stench rumba, furious frenzy, as if despojando, saying to no one in particular what he begins to hear, reverberating, break dancing, bomba, planting plena in a fijate. Wow. That was, a, that was, a, that was, a, yeah, a snap. Absolutely. That was a different vibe from the previous one. Um, what I'm knowing, um, what I'm noticing is there is um, this spiritual thread that runs through a lot of your work. There were a couple of questions about magic um, that came up in the chat. I heard some, some Orisha names being called, some deities. I, I, you mentioned George Floyd and his calling on his mother. I know some people in a certain spiritual community were saying that, you know, perhaps his mother showed up to come and take him from, from this physical life as he was leaving no. and that he was calling to her. There are so many different spiritual ideas in the black world that circulate around death, dying, loss, transitions. Um, so yeah, what's, what's with all the, the magic and spirituality in your work? Well, you know, I was raised with Santeria. You know, I was raised with the Yoruba traditions, um, the African traditions, and Catholicism, but not really, you know, being forced to do that. But I was seeing the rituals taking place in my household, in my uh, projects apartment, in Throsnick housing projects, with, with my aunt and them and stuff like that. They would have these you know, um, feasts, as they call them, for the saints and stuff like that. And the saints were African, you know, with, with the, the, the Catholic statuettes and the saints um, that represented the African deities. You know, you, uh, during slavery, you had to kind of hide those things, you know, to preserve your um, spiritual belief systems uh, right. under um, slavery. Right. White so supremacy. The, the Catholic saints, they, they hid their African deities behind the Catholic saints under, under Mary's, right? It's part of a whole makeup, a whole psychology, a whole philosophy, a whole spirituality, a whole cultural being. Um, that's why I talk, you know, I, I talked about the African and Indian, you know, that's the, the essence of mm -hmm. the Caribbean. And the Caribbean to me, the Caribbean, no matter what it is, English, uh, Francophone or Spanish, it's the center of the universe in this, on this planet, I believe. Mm -hmm. So what about Jesus in this last poem? There was some parallels between... Well, that's, that's to be... Um, that's a double entendre, you know, like Jesus or Jesus. You know, people name Jesus or Jesus himself, you know, so that's playing around with that. I mean, let me tell you something. When I wrote this poem, it just... It wrote itself. I didn't really like, you know, it just came out of me. So I can't really intellectualize the creativity of it, you know, the creation of it. It's something that like like the um the last two poems I read, the the George Floyd piece and like the um uh, Freddie Gray piece, they just kind of came out, you know. And so so to it with the um the little girl and, and her father getting um arrested by ICE agents and stuff like that. A lot of my poems do come out fully formed. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, I'll tell you what I got. I saw, I started seeing like, G like biblical Jesus. And, and, and I also started seeing, but then somehow I saw him working in a bodega. And then I saw this little kid, Jesus, that I went to seventh grade with, <laughs> who had moved That's down from New York to, to oh. you know, and he was all kinds of spicy, uh, 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 can, a type of like, you No, know, it is. Like it is like um, tapping on Jesus, you know. Yeah, yeah. As the everyday everyday cat that you know that's in the hood, you know. 
And just imagine if Jesus came, you know, how they would treat his, treat him and stuff. They would call him a, a communist, a socialist, and you know. Yeah, he would be one of our our, our dispossessed. He'd be um, arrested. Yeah, absolutely. He would be in another poem of yours. Um, so question, I'm trying to scroll up and get back to some questions. Two questions. Can you explain how how you turn your back to the audience when you read? I don't know if that's like a physiological question. Second question. Is it possible white people can gain accessibility to the authentic depth of black culture, passion, humanity, love, and all through your poetry? Yeah, I mean, they're not going to get everything, but um, I mean, art is universal, even though, you know, people don't think they are, even though Hollywood and all the, the institutions and forces try to, you know, erase shit until recently, you know, <laughs> when, you know, Sadly enough, when George Floyd was killed, now everybody wants to jump up and talk about diversity, diversity, diversity. Same thing happened in the 70s, you know, with the black writers and stuff like that, until they were out of fashion again. And this thing will go out of fashion again. And, you know, um, but that just tells you that we have to create our own institutions. You know, we have to have publishing houses and, and, and movie companies, and we have to tell our own stories and be in charge of our own ideas and our vocabulary and have nobody dictate what we could say or can't say as artists, as intellectuals. So um, that's nothing new. <sighs> right, that's been a common thread in, the, in each, um, each of our, our speakers during the series is, is just we kind of come down to the question of like, you know, where, where, where's the point of entry for white folks? And the answer is always, well, get in where you fit in, but we're going to keep doing Look, it our if, way. If, if, and we're we're able, gonna... if, Eli, if we're able to engage in white people's three-dimensionality all the time with the movies and the TV shows and the books, right. things, everything is about white people. Even the corny, crappy-ass bullshit movies, it's all white people, white people, white people. Then they can dig our shit, too. They can, you know, peep our stories right. and really look at it it's all universal. It just happens to be different cultures, different lingo, different styles. Mm -hmm. But I think right. white people can dig out stuff. Right. And the point is just to continue to do it on our terms. And you don't have to, you know, you, you don't have to even think about them. Just do you. Right. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, a question I have is about... Um, your work being that it is so fiery, it is so um, passionate, it is so deeply political, it's protest work, um, it, is, it is revolutionary work, it is influenced by revolutionary ideas. What are some of the challenges you face being that you are such a, um, a raw and kind of um, openly political artist? Um, what, have you had pushback or have you ever had, you know, experiences with people kind of trying to establish boundaries that, you know, you're not comfortable with. What, what, what have you bumped no, up against really in the work? I don't really recall that much pushback and because I'm not trying to appeal to white folks. I'm not trying to please anybody. I'm just trying to um, tell the stories of Michael's, you know, uh, tell the truth. Um, white too you know when I deal with class issues oh my goodness can you hear me yes can you hear me okay so um I don't think because I reconciled at an early age that I knew that the type of work that I was going to do was not going to have so many doors open up to me and stuff like that so I really don't have that uh, history of having those problems even by virtue of being a professor at Howard University, I don't have the problems that a lot of my contemporaries, my peers and my friends have that are at predominantly white institutions and stuff like that. Because I'm in a predominantly black, you know, I'm in a black institution and we get to be as open as possible. And it's like a family environment. So it's, it, I don't have to put on any bullshit airs, which I wouldn't do anyway. So I don't, I'm in a position, I'm like in a catbird seat. You know what I mean? 
I get yeah. to do my art and I get to teach what I want, you know? So I don't really have that. Um, I mean, I hear you, but you know, I, I, I'm Howard University is my alma mater. It's and, you know, the, the beautiful thing about Howard University, huh? The, the whole notion of me getting pushed back in this is, is foreign to me. Yeah. Because I don't really, it doesn't, you know, I don't deal with that. It's like when I was growing up, I was in the predominantly black in, in Latin neighborhood and area. So I didn't really mm -hmm. deal with the heavy, I mean, we faced racism and stuff, but it wasn't really heavy duty because I was in like a little cocoon of blackness. <laughs> I hear you, but you know, black takes on different forms, you know, because there are some conservative elements at places like Howard University, you know, maybe not in the English department per se, but they exist, you know. <laughs> I'm sure I've had, I'm sure people have probably denied me certain things like that, but I can't get caught up in all that bullshit. I just keep moving on and keep producing, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, I'm, I'm, even though I come out of, you know, I, I went through the whole thing, got a PhD and all that stuff. I consider myself an organic intellectual, like, you know, like um, Antonio Gramsci talks about and, and like Malcolm X, you know, self-taught. Mm -hmm. um, question in chat from, for those pieces that flow out of you effortlessly, what is your approach to revision? Um, revision really comes up a lot um, when I'm doing a book and I'm putting a book together. And I, sometimes I have to rethink the format of a piece and, you know, having other eyes look at something and stuff like that. Or you just never know when you look at something like so many years later or so many, you know, months later and stuff, uh, how that works. And that happens to a few pieces here and there, but not all pieces. I can't hear you. Stop. So I'm going to take a pause in the dialogue right quick, because this is the part of the program. Um, I, I do this every time. I'm going to, instead of showing you an image, I'm going to play an audio clip for you. And I, what I'm going to do, it's about a minute long. After the end of the audio clip, I want you to respond to what, what you hear. Just okay. off the dome. Okay? Let's go. Beauty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. But I think that is true of, of, of painters, sculptors, poets, musicians. I, it's what I'm concerned, it's their choice. But I choose to reflect the times and the situations in which I find myself. That to me is my duty. I, and, and, and at this crucial time in our lives, when everything is so desperate, when every day is a matter of survival, I don't think you can help but be involved. Young people, black and white, know this. That's why they're so involved in politics. We will shape and mold this country or it will not be molded and shaped at all anymore. So I don't think you have a choice. How can you be an artist and not reflect the times? That to me is the definition of an artist. All right, so that is... That definitely was Nina Simone. <laughs> yes. I love Nina Simone. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with an artist reflecting the times. Even if you write sci-fi or whatever, you will reflect the times. You take in all this stuff and then you just put it out in a different way. Um, yeah, that's my aesthetic. That's, that's what Jimmy Baldwin talked about, you know, bearing witness. And her and James Baldwin were, were buddies. Her, James Baldwin, Miles Davis, they were, they were like this, they were tight. Um, they would visit him in the South of France and they would stay up all night partying and then getting blitz and just having incredible, incredible conversations with so many different people. But yeah, um, I'm, in, I'm in the tradition of Nina Simone. I'm in the tradition of James Baldwin. I'm in the tradition of Lucille Clifton. I'm in the tradition of Pedro Pietri. I'm in the tradition of Tato Laviera. I'm in the tradition of Baraka of Ernesto Cardenal, of Amy Chazaire, you know, and on and on to the break of dawn. Right. That's oh, amazing. Man. Come on now. <laughs> That's powerful that you claim, <laughs> you claim a position in the tradition, that you claim that you claim your spot, your space, your place within the Langston. Langston was so 
Hold on a second. I people can't don't realize how militant. People don't realize how militant Langston Hughes was. How radical and revolutionary. If you go on YouTube, there's a video that these students did of a poem from Langston Hughes called Air Raid in Harlem. No joke. <laughs> Langston was no joke. And Langston was the model. He was, he was the ultimate leader of the Black arts movement. And none of them can tell you that he wasn't. You talking about, and he was in the Harlem Renaissance period, but it was Langston's example that they followed. I haven't heard that before. I haven't actually heard someone connecting Langston Hughes and as a foundation for the Black Arts Movement. And there's so much no movement. Now. No movement operates in a vacuum. Right. It's always a baton being passed from generation to generation. Right. I wrote a book about Langston Hughes, a children's book called Love to Langston. Right. But right. Um, how much time do we have? Because I might want to read some more. Um, we have about, we can do 20 more minutes. Okay. Yeah. And people want you to stay. So, so we'll do 20 more minutes. Do a little piece. Okay. From my um, graphic novel. Okay. Um, I am Alfonso Jones. Okay. Yeah, Wait, go we, we got one more question though. We got one more question about okay. your thoughts on other, other ethnicities, other people of color, Asians, so-called Hispanics. I love everybody. I just want people to be realistic about reality about class struggle, mm -hmm. about all of our connections. Um, okay. I mean, I think every culture is beautiful, is important, I love it. I think mm -hmm. we all should be as one. I think, I mean, I just, I, just, I just love the distinctions that we all have, but also mm -hmm. the similarity as humans, yeah. Right, okay, the question was really about allyship, you know what I mean, in terms of oh, allying I, themselves I, I, with I, black I, culture. I would, I'm with Mao Zedong, you know, the Bang Dung Conference, where mm -hmm. three fourth planet is is literally like black <laughs> or of color. So I'm into that, you know. I'm into that whole pan uh, people of color consciousness. Okay. And what Mao tried to do with the Bang Dung Conference was to get the African, the Asian, the Indian, all the people of color together, you know to form a power block mm -hmm. in conjunction with the European. So that's what um, I believe. Twyla, <laughs> um, I see your question. The cause, what's causing the great rift we see between Blacks and uh, Latinx people, our struggles are different and in some ways the same. I mean, there's so much historical uh, nonsense that causes it's a rift colorism, like that. It's, it's the colorism, it's mm -hmm. the um, intra-racism, it's also class. It's the denial of the African roots and the African genetics. It's colonialism, it's neo-colonialism, it's all that stupid, it's capitalism. All the complexities is all that bullshit. Yeah. Um, that causes the rift. And shifting um, people away from their true understanding the of history. You have Latin X. I don't even go, who comes up with these terms? Latin, Hispanic, all that shit. That does not point to Africa. That does not point to the Arawaks, the Tainos, you know, the indigenous. Come on, that's silly shit. Be specific. All right, so um, <clears throat> Alfonso Jones is um, a 16-year-old kid in Harlem who is really thriving in this school. And his father's behind bars. He's been there practically all his life. Um, <clears throat> and he gets he finds out that his father's getting out of prison on the D, on DNA exoneration and he's really excited and he wants to buy his first suit for his father's release in prison and in the process of that and this I'm not giving away too much because it happens in the first 20 pages in the process of, of picking out his first suit he's killed by the police mistaking his hanger for a gun and um Donetta Jimenez, his um, secret crush, is there to witness it. And so this piece <clears throat> is um, 
chapter 35 is called Born to Trauma. And it's from um, Alfonso's mother's perspective. Carmen, um, Carmen Jones. Um, and she is talking about basically, you know, what she has to deal with. Um, with her son being killed and no justice. It's called Born to Trauma. And this is what it looks like on the page. He was my miracle boy. The one who almost didn't make it. Every time he left the house, I prayed. You know what a mother goes through. Dream that ripped that cop's eyes out. Scream and swung and scratched at his face and woke in a sweat screaming. What have you done? What have you done? What have you done to my beautiful baby boy? I'm not going to let you turn my son's death into a reality show episode every few weeks Every so many months, another black body at the hands of white police, black police, any old police. Here you come again, trying to parade us around TV to cry on cue, cry out for a justice he never, we never get. We're not going to let you make a circus of our pain. Our black misery is not for your white amusement. Why do you think I fought? to get my son into Henry Dumas because it was a school that was created from grassroots organizing and did not depend upon a curriculum that excluded his reality. Had that damn security guard cop, Officer Whitson, went to a school whose books reflected a broader reality than his narrow lily white mind, had movies, TV, Whatever reflected that, maybe he would have seen my son as a teenager, as a person, as a citizen, as an American, as a human, and not something to be so easily, so rapidly, so wistfully disposed of. His girlfriend said he shot my baby like a deer like a deer and all he was doing was buying his first suit all he was doing was trying on a damn suit i guess you got what you wanted I can tell why this book, this book um, won all of the awards, this graphic novel of yours. What age, what age groups would you recommend uh, read a book like that? 12 and up, depending upon, you know, their parents. Um, well, if they're younger, maybe the parents need to know, mm -hmm. approve of. Mm -hmm. What tips do you have for youth writers, young people who are trying to write and, and start as poets and, and creative writers? I always, you know, my, my magic trick is always to read, to immerse yourself in whatever you want to write. And in that process, you learn how to do it. You know, um, I read a lot of graphic novels. I saw a lot of movies, a lot of um, great television shows. Um, and just started to look at things uh, the way an artist would do, analyzing things, you know, like how boxers analyze fights and stuff like that. Um, or after every game, an, a, a pro team just looks at tape and um, you just learn stuff, you know, um, but you got to read, you got to take in a lot, of, a lot of music, art, all that stuff. You got to feed your brain, basically, so you can have something... Uh, to inspire you and also something to say. Okay. So we know that you, you have jazz as an influence. You mentioned TV shows. I've watched a couple TV shows recently that I, I feel kind of have a very reflective look at history. Um, 
Lovecraft Country has been a latest obsession of mine. I also recently watched Vampires vs. the Bronx. It actually was shot in a uh, part of the Bronx I lived in for a little while. Um, I live in the Bronx. <laughs> I, yeah, I heard. I heard. So I, I used to live right by Yankee Stadium off, off the Concord. Bronx. That's where I was born in the South Bronx. Yeah, yeah. I was right off 161st. Utopia is um, a good show. Utopia. Okay. And I'll check it out. The Queen's Gambit. That's the last thing I saw. It's off the chain. It's beautiful. Okay. Utopia and the Queen's Gambit. Um, so um, some of your, your greats, some of the Black Arts Movement artists, Sonia Sanchez was referenced in Lovecraft Country. Yeah, that was so beautiful. Yeah. Um, they had Gil Scott Heron. I mean, they had James Baldwin. Some of the people- Writers know the time it tears. It's so good when you have writers that are like really hip and you, you could tell they went to school and you could tell their dedication right so, uh, the black arts you know that's right right audrey lord was in there who else did they have in there sun ra i mean they went all kinds of places see what happens when you give when black folks are allowed to do what they got to do and right. there's no um you know filters and you know the red lights instead of the green lights when, when we can do what we got to do that's right so. um so i really appreciate the the, the ancestors that you've been calling all evening um, and giving the credit because we sometimes forget to call the names of our influences. We're so busy sitting there collecting all of them. <laughs> I was raised on my grandmother, so I always revere my elders, you know. And right. you know, in in my um, belief system, it's all about the ancestors. And in 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 the the novel, I am Alfonso Jones. Actually, you don't notice, but Alfonso Jones is actually telling the story from the position of an ancestor of a spirit. Wow. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow. And That's... other ancestors show up to teach him shit in the um that middle um phase when you don't get justice. Okay, so my daughter's gonna need that book. She's 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 way into that. She would she would love that. Um a question in the chat. Your scenes. Oh, and I also encourage everybody to get your questions in um as we try to bring the the the, the event to a close. So if you have a question, a burning question, please post in the chat so we can uh, present it to Dr. Medina. Um, you know, I, want, I, I might want to end up reading a poem or two, so, you know. All right. We're going to weave it together. Um, it says, oh, is there, a, is there a trigger warning of some sort in your books because they are, and, and your, your, you know, your poems, because there's so much trauma that is being revisited? No. Uh, I don't know why there's so much sensitivity these days. We didn't have these things growing up and stuff like that. I know that people have been traumatized. But I think the subject matter alone um, lets you know that you might want to take heed to the heaviosity of, of the narratives. Yeah, I don't do trigger warnings. I do trigger warnings when I'm posting on Facebook or, or Twitter or when I'm doing something in, in the classroom because I'm sensitive to, you know, my direct audience. Mm -hmm. Well, I would do a trigger warning in a reading, a live reading where I would say, well, you know, this doesn't have the right language. Maybe that's the kids should go or whatever. And so the parents be like, nah, they can hear that. But um, no. Um, right. I hear you. Um, relatedly, another question is that you mentioned um, people are born with creativity, but some need to be inspired to tap into it. Would you that's say that this the is the same? Is that people, you know, everybody is born a poet. Yeah, the Nicaraguans believe that. Would you say the same thing goes for love like we we all have love and we're created from love but ongoing and intergenerational trauma has kind of impacted our ability to tap into that love can creativity release love i guess i'm trying to understand the question can the release of creativity, creativity can um release empathy and understanding and that can garner um feelings of love or um it can you know um you know lead to that I think um, that's what art is about. You know, art is 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 um, all pieces of art are just empathy machines. <laughs> you know, we when I was watching the Queen's Gambit, you know, there were several points in which I got really choked up, and particularly the ending, where I was like, you know, I was getting verklempt, as they say. You know what I mean? I was getting emotional, but that's what great art does. I mean, I love to be brought to tears. I love to get emotional. I love to laugh hysterically, but you know, 
I love it when it's very sad and sentimental because it's really getting at you. It's really right. placing you in that other person's shoes, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's what's wrong with our nation, you know? Like, almost half the country is not empathetic. They're just like following this psychopath, you know, uh, to the ends of, 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 of the earth. So besides Nina Simone, who else should be on this protest playlist? Who, who else should we be listening to? On, who else man. do you listen to? Coltrane, Bob Marley, Prince. Come on, man. KRS, you know, um, ODB. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, even though Miles Davis was a bit abusive and stuff, but he's still fascinating his music. Okay. Steam. Um, Mm -hmm. But Jean-Michel Basquiat, I love stuff, you know, Basquiat. Okay, that was going to be my next question about visual art. Who do, who, who do you like to look at? Oh, I love Miro. You know, Jean Miro is one of my favorites. I just love his stuff. Uh, Basquiat, I mean, I have so many book covers with Basquiat. <laughs> his work on the cover. It's like I'm addicted to Basquiat's work. Um, mm -hmm. Picasso, of course. Picasso, I love Picasso because he did everything. <laughs> he could... He just said, okay, I'll, I could do that, you know. And that's the kind of writer I like to, I like to be a poet where I can say, oh, I could do that, I could do that. You know, you could just rock any style, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Diego right. Rivera, but he was just such a fuck up, fucked up husband. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, where do we draw the line? Like, when does someone get canceled? Like, how much is too much in terms of canceling? I, I, don't, really, I don't really dig the whole notion of cancel culture. I think we gotta we gotta figure out how to you know do that. I mean, literally, like in our time, I think um, Pearl Cleague started this cancel culture stuff back in the the late '80s, early '90s, when she put out this essay, which was turned into a book called "Mad at Miles," and she read Miles's autobiography, and he was very open. And he talked about his abuse of the great Cicely Tyson, you know, one of my favorite actresses, actors, and she's so beautiful. Um, and she was pissed at him and she said, we should just take all his albums and CDs and just like destroy them and blah, blah, blah. But then years later, she kind of changed her tune about that and thought that we could separate, you know, we could take the art and just separate the, the, um, the fallacies of the artists, you know what I mean? So it's a very complicated thing, this whole cancel culture. I mean, if you're, if you're Hitler, then that's a cancel, <laughs> you know? But you know, there's so many complexities to, you know, artists and their foibles. Okay, so outside of reading Hitler poetry, should we all be reading more poetry? In what ways do you think society would be transformed if we I think, but I think people should read poetry daily, like, like they pray, like they read scripture like they eat bread you know um it should be broadcast um jazz should be played every day jazz should be broadcast i think these are things that just build you up intellectually and spiritually you know i think in our school systems they should you know every day at the pa system they should read a poem the kids should read a poem out loud to everybody and they should play music they should play jazz you know jazz is a is the most intellectual art form. It just like, it spreads the powers of the brains and synapses to, to start to connect and grow and you just get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Word, it's that way for me. I listen to spiritual jazz. Like I'm a Pharaoh Saunders person. Like when I need to grade papers or like be smart. <laughs> birthday was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, I gotta get my Alice Coltrane out, you know? Um, Sanders came to Howard University's chapel a couple uh, some years back. I saw him. Uh, wow, Farrah Sanders was at Howard. <laughs> wow. Um, so uh, I'll I'll leave you the remainder of the time. We got maybe five to eight minutes. What you got? Okay, let me just try to close it out, man. Uh, this is called "In Venice, Dolphins Swim the Canals." You know, when we was pandemicking in place, I had to write a poem, right? In Venice, dolphins swim the canals. As LA skies are crystal ball clear, 
predicting the coming of the cicadas and DC's cherry blossoms opening early, like parasol debutante umbrellas. The streets are empty. Everyone is sheltered in as a virus rages like Ralph Ellison, invisible to the naked eye, while a naked ape in orange idiot Sansa Savant is babbling about it being a hoax, a hoax. It's all a hoax, telling us from the White White House, don't believe your lying eyes as refrigerated trucks in Brooklyn stockpile bodies and freezers like popsicles. This Agent Orange menace is a virus onto himself as racism is, as stupidity is, in a country where Confederate statues are more visible than common sense. A virus named after a cheap piss water beer. This menace barks China, China. China, as if repulsed by his wife's vagina. At a press conference, he bogarts the mic from the experts who know more about science than he knows about stealing, telling us hydroxychloroquine, malaria pills are good as tic tacs at fighting bad breath. He should know, and if that doesn't work, you could spray down your tongue with Lysol or belt back some Clorox to crank your box. In Venice, Dolphins swim the canals, free of debris, while here black joggers are hunted by fathers and sons in a rite of passage, Jim Crow outdoor trailer trash, Paul again, as Amy or Karen or Becky with the bad brain scream hysterically into cell phones at 911 operators in their worst Stanislavski method acting, like the black birder is a mockingbird, while an essential worker EMT cannot get any PPE. Instead, she got eight bullets into her bone tired sleeping body in a 21 gun salute to T.S. Eliot with a side of side eye because May is the cruelest month, especially during a lockdown where racism and hate are never quarantined, yet a black man remains a stepping stool for a white man's knee who drummed out Colin Kaepernick as if a flag takes precedence over a black life. That was powerful. One Thank more. You so much. Thank <laughs> you so much. You, it's, 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 it's your show. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm going to take one more poem. There are, there are people asking about poems you would recommend for students, particularly high school students a collection you would share with students of that age? Resisting Arrest, the one that I did is really good. It's powerful. Resisting Arrest. Got it. Um, did I edit it? So, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to close it out. I'm going to I'm going to have you get the last word. Like your whatever you want to leave us with. I want to say thank you to Dr. Tony Medina. Thank you so much for your time, your 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 enthusiasm, your passion, your 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 creativity, your spirit. Um thank you all for the chat and being so thank present you. with us. Um, listening with oh, us. Incredible. Um, if you want to watch this again, it will be on YouTube on the PGCC TV Are website. Are you going to save the chat responses? Because this is incredible. Yes, I'll send you the transcript. Um, and this will be up in about a week. Um, share it with your friends. We, we hope to do many more programs like this in the future. And this is just, this is amazing. I feel very privileged to be Thank here. Thank you with for you. inviting me. And I love uh, PG Community College. I wouldn't mind teaching at PG Community College because it's like too close to where I live. But um, <laughs> we're gonna work on that. Really, and I I would if there's time I would like to close out with a poem that leads up to our election day on Tuesday, which I gave my students off so they could vote, 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 vote. And because we're so anxious about Tuesday election day, right? It's called "How It Will Finally Come to an End." Trump on the toilet like Elvis, mainlining dry beef burgers and hydroxychloroquine. Melania in the Lincoln bedroom, dousing it with Lysol and Clorox to mask the smell emanating from the bedroom, from the bathroom. An alarm is tripped. Secret service can be heard managing muffled screams as if need in the nuts. A sniper on the roof can be heard yelling as he falls into a burning bush. Protesters have breached the white, white house fence. Flames are everywhere. Trump doesn't even have time to wipe his ass or send up one last tweet 
before he falls on his bloated face with a turd the size of a 1973 Buick sticking out his ass. Melania rushes in with a PPE mask and is suddenly overcome by her husband's obnoxious fumes. She can only manage a be best between coughs. Trump is yelling to her to help him get the Lincoln log out his ass as his face orange smears the cold white tiles as Melania struggles with the turd cemented in her donkey's ass. Protesters have lit the white white house on fire. It resembles a tulip of flames. Melania finally comes to her senses and drags Trump by the turd in his lace front. She managed to drag his fat ass down the stairs, but is met by L's donning MAGA hat singing, Oh, oh, Antifa. We could make it together. Melania watching shit go up in flames, weighs her options, grabs a few furs, her jewelry, and Trump's credit cards and leaves him to be turned into a hobby horse for the MAGA elves. She chunks up the deuces to Trump, crying and blubbering like a bloated baby, and says, be best, and bounces with the last and loneliest Secret Service agent left standing. Thank you. Any last questions? I think that's where we got to drop the mic. We got to drop the mic, Tony. <laughs> I'm going to restate the disclaimer from the beginning. You know, that is that applies to PG Community College, applies to Maryland Humanities. But um, outside of all of that, Tony Medina is out here representing for all of us, for the black world, for the ancestors, for the future generations, the beautiful ones not yet born. Poetry is life, y'all. Um, it's an important part of black culture and that's why it's a part of this series. Thank you so much for being with us again. Have a good night. Be safe and healthy, everyone. We'll see you next time. November 20th, peace. Vote. <laughs>